food has something that we cannot really get in supplements that is so important for our immune system. And that is the phytonutrients, these mm -hmm. plant compounds that are found in, in, in plant foods that um, have antioxidant potential, antimicrobial potential, the kind of longevity nutrients. They keep our immune system young. They turn on um, genes involved in, in longevity. They turn off unwanted inflammation. You know, you're talking polyphenols, um, things like curcumin, um, resveratrol, uh, you know, the ones that are very well studied, turns out there's almost 30,000 different phytonutrients that have been identified. They're working synergistically. Um, there's lots of attempts to put them into um, capsule. Get those 200 compounds from ginger into one. <laughs> exactly. And, and um, a friend of mine who works in the US was, was involved in testing different supplements to look at the, the activity of the phytonutrients inside. And, and it turns out that this varies hugely on the market. So you might be spending a lot of money and you're not getting uh, what you think is in there because it's quite hard to encapsulate that what nature has yeah. put together often it's it's the chewing or the eating with other foods or the consumption with other foods that it's having that synergistic effect and making chemical reactions that make these things bioavailable so i think that you know you cannot rely on getting that from a supplement there's nothing quite like getting it from food and food yeah. is conveniently packaged with fiber um, and fiber is feeding the microbes in your gut. That's their preferred food. So eat, eat for your gut bugs because they're the kind of key educators and trainers of your immune system. So this is happening right from birth when we begin to be colonized with these microbes. And there's, you know, over 70 percent of your immune system along along the gut. And it's kind of a real area of immune tolerance. So training your immune system not to respond to things um, unnecessarily. So preventing allergies, um, inflammatory diseases, and controlling how well we respond to infections without overshooting. So, And that's a really interesting area too, isn't it, when kids, because we've seen studies with like kids who are in more rural children who are exposed to dirt and farms and things, and then the less yeah. overactivation they might have versus sometimes in the, in the urban environments, those rates might be a little higher of, of immune exactly. overactivation. Yeah, I mean, if you consider we're sort of relatively sterile in utero, and then when we come out, we, we get exposed to whatever's in our environment. Um, breast milk uh, contains certain fibers that are designed not to feed the baby. And it did confuse scientists for a long time. Like, oh, these human milk oligosaccharides, why, why are What's they in breast milk? <laughs> yeah. The baby's not getting any nutrition from these, but they're cultivating the right types of microbes in the gut. It's like a fertilizer. So um, it, it's providing the food to really cultivate this diverse gut microbiome that we need. And then uh, as we you know, start eating, that's also having an effect on our microbiome exposure. And going back to your point with um, the, the rural kids versus the city kids, I think this was back in the 80s with um, this chap called Strachan, who's famous for um, the hygiene hypothesis, mm -hmm. which has kind of been replaced uh, and, and updated with the biodiversity hypothesis. Because I think hygiene hypothesis makes us think that we have to be really hygienic and it, it's, it's, it's dirt is good. Mm -hmm. It's not about infections. It, it, hygiene is important. Washing your hands after the bathroom when, before you eat food. It's more about the biodiversity in your environment that is important. And if we um, reduce that through over sanitizing, not getting enough exposure to green environments, then we're not giving our immune system those inputs from those good bacteria because if you consider everything that you touch and breathe is filled with bacteria you want to be in the environments with the good ones which is generally the green natural environment so you can breathe and nurture your gut microbiome which i think is something that's not really uh, appreciated Definitely not. And I'm going to circle back to this as we get to the end, because some interesting comments that I've heard you make about that as well. Um, but coming back to food, and if we look at different colors of food, is this something that we should be thinking about? Like the, obviously the orange colors, we're thinking beta carotene, vitamin A, what are some of the foods that you like to have on your plate or your client's plate as you get into the winter? Oh, yes, definitely. So the orange, like you say, the beta carotene, the vitamin A, it's known as the anti-infective vitamin. And you can also get it from animal foods. So liver is like a really rich mm. source of active form of vitamin A. But and you those, can hide the liver really well in like ground beef exactly. and <laughs> chilies, bolognese. Okay. Yeah, I do this a lot with, with my 
my kids um, coming into autumn, we get loads of the seasonal produce. And there's actually some evidence that eating seasonally, whether you live somewhere like the UK where we are, or whether you live in the country where you have a rainy and a dry season, that the produce that's growing at that time supports your immune system for the type of infections that are associated with those conditions. In the colder seasons, we get more of these respiratory viruses because they like the cooler climate. So all the, the reds and oranges, get those into your diet, make some really hearty curries, stews, these sorts of things. Combine them with things like lentils. If people do eat meat, why not take away half the meat and put in a plant-based protein source because that's bringing in fiber. The animal-based protein source is bringing in other key nutrients like B12. Um, leafy greens is my my personal favorite because I think generally we're not eating enough of them and they have these sulfur rich compounds in them which are really important for longevity gene patterns that we want to switch on um, really important for immune regulation and providing so many uh, of these sort of key phytonutrients that uh, are really good for the overall balance of the immune system and getting enough protein is actually quite important and protein energy malnutrition is probably the biggest factor causing immune deficiency worldwide. I think here in the UK, we have access to plenty of different protein sources, but I speak to many people who've sort of reduced meat consumption and haven't maybe brought in those plant rich protein sources to replace them. And again, going back to what we said about getting older and maintaining muscle mass having that um, pool of those amino acids, those building blocks from dietary protein is really important to help your body sort of hang on to that muscle mass too. hundred percent. And what about some of the ancestral things, you know, when we think of chicken soup, you know, from a, yes, yeah. from a science standpoint, I mean, these soups, you know, we feel like they're reducing congestion or bringing yeah. on board some nutrients, but where, where are we at in terms of yeah. is the placebo effect enough? I mean, I like the placebo effect. I'll take any yeah. effect I can get. Me too. I'm a fan of the placebo effect. If it's feeling good and, um, you know, particularly in winter, we want to have a bit of agency over our health. So sometimes it can make us feel like we're being proactive, which can then make us feel better. Uh, uh, and that's, you know, that access between the brain and the immune system is very real. Um, but yeah, chicken soup has L-carnosine, which is coming from the, the chicken stock. And this has been shown to actually help these white blood cells move into the location where they're needed. So if you have a respiratory infection to get in there, help with dealing with that infection. Plus it's hydrating, it's comforting. You can add all those lovely orange veggies in there and you can add loads of leafy greens in there and the heat and the steam can help relieve some of that mucus and nasal congestion to get things flowing. And it's kind of like a hug in a mug. You feel better having it. So, so yeah, there's definitely science behind the chicken yes. soup idea. <laughs> Let's keep those stews and soups going for the fall. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if we just touch on supplementation, I mean, if we feel like we're coming down with something versus acutely sick, are there different strategies there or perhaps some go-tos yeah. that you like to use? Well, I, I guess I, I like to focus on the diet pattern and the kind of food first approach as your baseline. The one thing I didn't mention was vitamin D, which if you live somewhere like the UK in the winter, you're not probably going to get enough from sun. Sunlight has many other benefits on the immune system. So getting outdoors is important, getting in the mm. fresh air. But um, it is advisable to either have your vitamin D levels checked or start supplementing in October until uh, April. If you're someone who's indoors a lot, has darker skin or is older, you might want to be supplementing all year round. Yep. Um, and then when you do get sick, I kind of like to keep my little um, cupboard in the kitchen with some things that I can pull out to make me feel better quicker. Um, what I don't do is take all the over-the-counter medicines from the pharmacy because generally they, they might make you feel better and you can go to work and you can function, but they're suppressing the immune system in order to make you feel better. So that might be something that you want to do if you really have to be at work or you've got a big deadline, but actually the best thing you can do is just stop and take a day to rest because having one or two days to recover will get you back on your feet quicker than just trying to show up to work. And we have that sort of culture of presenteeism where we want to go to work, show that we're there, even though we've got this cold and we're sneezing everywhere and we're spreading our germs on the bus on our commute to our colleagues. So there's, one, there's one thing COVID's taught us is that people aren't 
people aren't a fan of that anymore. Exactly. <laughs> Stay home if you're not well. <laughs> it's definitely uh, given that whole coughs and sneezes, spread diseases, a revamp. Like, yeah. yeah, stay away, stay home. 